had the honor of blending medicine and law. Nine, again, 90% of my time is spent in patient care, in patient practice of psychiatry, both child and adolescent, general adult, and forensic as well. I still, still keep up my legal skills, I hope, and I have the privilege, pleasure, and honor of being the professor of medical jurisprudence and medical ethics at the medical school in Kirksville, Missouri. We're going to look at issues today surrounding medical jurisprudence and medical ethics. I know you all have had lectures the last couple of days, yes, with regard to the law. I'm going to do a little background in that again. I hope that is okay. Repetition helps us to remember. And very good. The American legal and judicial system. This slide gives a, an overview. Remember, our legal system in the United States is built upon the foundation of the Constitution. And in fact, if I were to ask how many constitutions are there, most would say, well, there's one. Actually, there are 51, because each of the states has a constitution as well. So we have 50 state constitutions, and then we have the overarching United States Constitution. Our law is based on these documents that set up and establish our judicial system. The U.S. Constitution provides for a tripartite form of government. So that what does that mean? We have checks and balances. We have the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. When we look at the legal system, it is also tripartite. What do we have? We have trial courts, we have appeals courts, and then we have a Supreme Court. We have that both at the federal level and at the state level. You all covered that the last couple of days, so you all are on top of all of that. Okay. And when we look at this, the laws that we have, they are established legislatively. So our legislatures, both state and federal, pass laws, and then the courts hear the law. In a courtroom, who are the participants? The courtroom is an arena. The courtroom is drama and theater. And it is into that arena that you will find yourselves from time to time as physicians. You will be asked to testify. We're going to look at that today and we'll address the different roles that you may play when you're doing that. And when we think about this arena, who do we have in the arena? Again, it depends on whether or not we're looking at <coughs> civil and criminal. What is the difference between civil and criminal? In a civil case, there are two attorneys, and one represents a complainant, someone coming in and complaining about an issue. That is the plaintiff. And someone represents a defendant, someone defending against a claim made. In civil cases, which is usually where you will find yourself testifying, civil cases typically are to right a wrong. And how do we typically do that in a civil case? Typically in civil cases, what we're thinking about, talking about, is money. And that is usually green poultice is what salves the wound, and that is what we see. So again, when we think about that, we realize that the courtroom is about taking someone's funds and setting them on fire. <coughs> and so we, as clinicians and physicians, may be asked to testify with regard to that. Criminal cases, instead of a complainant and a defendant, the state comes in. The state is representing the people. And in criminal cases, we are typically looking at righting a wrong, and the defendants, instead of typically salving the wound with just money, we're looking at sequestration, taking someone who has acted badly out of society and putting them somewhere else to keep society safe. We are talking about punishment, punishing someone, bless you, and we're talking about rehabilitation. 
helping someone become a rehab. And so that's the criminal side. Most of us will be asked <coughs> to testify typically on the civil side. However, you may be asked to testify on the criminal side as well when it comes to abuse and other types of issues. When we think about that arena, the courtroom, what are we going to see? Again, we have the judge. The judge is the trier of law. And we may have a jury, may not. It may just be a bench trial where the judge hears the case and then makes a decision. In a jury trial, the jury is the trier of fact. What does that mean? That means the jury determines in that he said, she said, or he said, he said, or she said, she said, uh, who they believe. So the courtroom, again, is a theater. And into that theater come the two main combatants, those are the attorneys. There's an attorney for each side. And the attorneys are there to sway and persuade and convince the jury as to what the decision should be. And the judge is the purveyor of the law. And the judge will, in fact, instruct the jury on how to apply the law to the facts to make a determination. As a physician, you may be called into the courtroom to testify based upon your knowledge, especially your scientific knowledge, and you will be there to tell the truth. You may be the only person in that courtroom who is there to tell the truth. You may be the only person there in the courtroom who is not out to win anything or prove anything. You are merely there to explain the science. That's it. Please keep that in mind. You're not there to win a case. You're not there to serve anyone other than the truth. We'll come back to that momentarily. The American jurisprudential system is unique in that it is adversarial. What does that mean? Well, we have two sides to each case. Remember, there are actually three sides to every case. The plaintiffs, the defendants, and the truth. Hopefully somewhere all three will intersect and an appropriate decision will be made. When we think about our adversarial system, we are not an inquisitorial system. We are not a system wherein a judge sits and interrogates and then makes a decision. We are instead a system where both sides argue and present information and present witnesses and facts. And then someone makes a determination based upon the debate that goes on in the arena that is called the courtroom. We have an adversarial system. However, our adversarial system is friendly. And what makes our adversarial system friendly? Discovery. And what is discovery? Discovery is the ability to obtain the information that the opposing party has and that you both have to share. So contrary to what you may see in the movies, on television, there are not supposed to be surprises in the courtroom. Everyone's supposed to share their facts with each other. Now, how is that done? That is done through different motions and different techniques of obtaining documents and witness information. And you'll notice on your slide, the discovery has with it depositions, interrogatories, production of documents, and requests for admissions. What is this all about? Well, you'll also notice I talk about the stability of our judicial system. I know you all have discussed this earlier, stare decisis and uh, precedent. You all discussed that. Are you familiar with that? What that is, it is American judicial system is based upon the common law that comes out of England. I won't go into this in great detail because of time constraints. However, what I will tell you is our law is expected to be stable. So what does that mean? 
That means the same set of facts typically result in the same decision. Precedent. A case may occur where the facts are unique and a decision is rendered. A jury may present a decision, a judge may drop the gavel on a specific decision, and that precedent is a previously decided case that is now recognized as the standard for the resolution of conflict based upon the same set of facts. And so stare decisis is the concept of let the decision stand. So you know that in these cases, these facts brought about this result. So now, if you have the same facts going on in your conflict, you can rely on those past cases to have a good handle on what the result most likely will be. And that provides the stability in our American judicial system. And that also allows us to understand that if we perform the following acts, it's most likely that we will have the following result, because that is what the case law tells us. Obtaining information. Information is the key in the courtroom. That's what it's all about. Facts. In order to present an appropriate case, we have to have access to witnesses, documents, experts. And we have to be able to preserve information. How is this done? Well, we obtain information in different ways. And one of the techniques that we use to obtain documents, as well as to obtain witnesses, is a subpoena. Have you all discussed the subpoena in the last several days, previous days? Do you know a subpoena actually comes from the Latin and means under penalty? So it means that you can subpoena someone to come and testify, or you can subpoena a document. When you subpoena someone to come and testify, that's a subpoena ad testificandum. That is asking someone to come and testify. Then there is the subpoena ducis tecum, ducis tecum. What is that? That is to bring with you. So you are under penalty. You are required to bring with you certain documents. Now, again, as a physician, if you were subpoenaed to bring a chart, does that mean if you go to the chart that's there, and you pull that chart, and you're going to electronic records now. However, some practices still have an actual chart. And does that mean you bring the actual chart to the courtroom or deliver that actual chart to opposing counsel? No. You deliver a copy of it, because the chart itself is a legal document. And it has to stay where it is deposited. And that means the practice owns the chart. The patient owns the information within it. So the patient is entitled to a copy of it. And when properly subpoenaed, that information can be copied and then delivered to the opposing counsel. Now, again, it depends what type of information is being subpoenaed. If it is a mental health chart, there are other requirements than just meeting the subpoena. There has to be a court order signed by a judge requiring that information. And if you feel that the information contained therein may be more information that is needed for the case, you can ask the judge to review the information in camera and then redact. That means remove information that is not germane to the case so that you don't present more information than is necessary. I'll just share that. And I will move on. I have to be careful. I know I'm not here to teach the full medical jurisprudence course in our hour and a half time. Depositions interrogatories. That's what we're going to look at today as well as courtroom testimony. Depositions and interrogatories. Interrogatories are written. What does that mean? That means that information is sought. You as the physician may receive an interrogatory. That means a packet will come to you. And that packet is typewritten. And it asks questions and leaves spaces for your answers. Bless you. And then you will put in the answers. And those answers become part of a legal document. That's the interrogatory. You then send that to the counsel that requested the interrogatory from you. That's written. That becomes part of the court record. And then if you fill out the written interrogatory, should you then be subpoenaed to court to testify, 
you'll be held to the answers that are in that interrogatory. Now, can you change your answers? Certainly you can. When you appear in court and if you're asked to testify, can your answers be different from what was in the interrogatory? Yes, they can. However, you want to have a good reason, an explanation for the change in the answer because you may be asked by the counsel that is cross-examining you or examining you in direct, which we'll talk about momentarily, you may be asked, doctor, can you please tell me uh, what happened on this date? And you may explain. And then counsel may say to you, doctor, do you remember the written interrogatory that was sent to you and that you filled out in your office and essentially under oath and it is part of the court document, it is a legal document? Yes, I do. Do you remember the answer that you put in the interrogatory? And you may say, no, I don't. And the attorney will say, let me refresh your memory. And he or she will read from that. And it may be directly opposite of the answer you just gave. And the counsel may say, would you please tell the jury, doctor, were you lying then or are you lying now? Hopefully they can't do that. They're not allowed to use that question only on TV. <laughs> However, the key is the attorney will say, you know, doctor, the answer that you gave in the interrogatory is quite different from what you're saying here today. And they may not ask you a question any further, and they may just want to leave doubt in the jury's mind about your veracity, your credibility. So again, you want to be able to have another attorney, which we'll go into, rehabilitate your answer and allow you to explain the difference. The bottom line is, if an interrogatory is filled out, review it before you go to court. Remember what's in the interrogatory. Have a copy of it. Make a copy of it. And if you are asked on the witness stand to respond to a question with regard to an interrogatory or a deposition, you may ask to see a copy of it then and there, reread it, and then you may give your answer. We'll get to that momentarily. I'm ahead of myself on the slide. Depositions. What are depositions? Depositions are live, in person. In an office, a deposition is you are questioned by an attorney under oath with a court reporter present who is typing in the information to become part of the court record to be used at a later date. Deposition is in person where an interrogatory is filling out questions on paper and then sending them back. And we'll go into this in greater detail momentarily. The deposition. The deposition may be the first opportunity for an opposing attorney to see you, to talk with you, and to obtain information from you. What is the purpose of a deposition? The purpose of a deposition is to obtain information and or to preserve information. Witnesses may not be available for a courtroom proceeding. Because typically, when a case actually comes to the court, maybe several years out from when it is initial, initially uh, presented to uh, the circuit clerk to be filed, it may take several years before the case actually comes to fruition. Witnesses may pass away. You want to preserve that information. Memories change. Memories fade. So you want to get the information, quote unquote, locked in. And that's what depositions are for, one of the purposes. Another purpose of a deposition is a fishing expedition. An attorney may not know what direction the case may go. The attorney may not know what is going on medically in the case. So the attorney may want to engage in a fishing expedition and ask all kinds of questions of you seeking to find an appropriate approach to the courtroom drama yet to occur. Cases may not involve you. This may not be a case that has anything to do with you, per se, or your practice. It only has to do with the information you hold with regard to a patient or something that's transpired that has medical implications. So again, please know that in some cases, 
Yes, it may be a malpractice issue. It may be related directly to your practice as a physician. However, most of the testifying you will do will not be related to that. Three-fourths of all civil cases have a medical chart involved in some way. One-fourth of all criminal cases involve information contained within a medical chart, neither of which may have anything to do with your practice. We may be talking about child custody. We may be talking about a divorce proceeding. There are a lot of issues. We may be talking about a motor vehicle accident, and medical testimony is needed to establish the damages, the injuries. As you all remember, perhaps over the last several days, that when we're talking about personal injury, when we're talking about issues in the law, when we're talking about even malpractice, the four Ds, have those been discussed? The duty, dereliction of the duty, direct causation, and damages. You may be brought in to testify on damages. What are the damages? And so you as the physician are aware of the physical injury comprising the damages with which the individual is, from which they are suffering and with which they may have to live for the rest of their lives. When we look at depositions, this is where the opposing counsel has the opportunity to ask you questions. And when this opposing counsel is asking you <coughs> questions, you're under no obligation to help him or her. You're not there to guide him or her. You're not there to say, counsel, you ought to be asking this question. Try this one on for size. That's not your role. Your role is simply to answer the questions that are being asked. And your role is to answer just the question that's being asked and to be as succinct as possible. That's your role. You're not there to win a case. You're not there to try the case. And in a deposition, you are merely there essentially to say, yes, no, I don't remember. Most witnesses have a natural tendency to want to tell everything they know. And that's not what this is about. It must be overcome to be an effective witness. As a physician, you just want to be able to say yes, no, and or explain the answer in very clear, understandable terms. Listen to the question. Provide only as much testimony as is necessary to respond truthfully to the question. And be careful not to volunteer more information than the question asks. When you're finished with an answer, you feel it's complete and it is truthful, then just remain quiet and wait for the attorney to ask you another question or to excuse you. As noted here on the slide, as best you can in a deposition, just say yes or no. That's all that's needed in the deposition. The dilemma is this. If you give more information than is necessary, what it may do is give the attorney a whole new direction in which to go, which may create more problems. So again, you want to be very careful in your answers. I hammer this point. Again, you're not there to be helpful. You're just there to answer the questions yes or no. And again, in a deposition, as in the courtroom, disregard the opposing attorney's attitude. Pay no attention because he or she may be attempting to get you riled. They may be attempting to, quote, unquote, bait you to say something that then may be utilized adversely against the information that you're really given. So you want to be very careful. Just be as comfortable and as relaxed as you can be and as professional as you can be at all times. Now, during a deposition, you can take a break. It's OK. You're not on trial. You are being asked questions. You are being deposed. You are effectively under oath. However, if you need to take a break, you can. That's the beauty to a deposition. You're not in a courtroom. You are most likely either in your own office or in, another attorney, in an attorney's office. 
And so if you feel the need, you can ask for a break. If you're hungry, if you need to use the restroom, you may do that. By the same token, be certain for a deposition to leave enough time for the deposition in your schedule so that you can hopefully complete it. You don't want to end the deposition unnecessarily early because you don't want to have to do several depositions. You want to get it all done at one time. And so when you schedule, or when it's being scheduled for you, you serve to leave enough time. Also, allow the attorney who is seeking to depose you to understand how much time you have. And so what you may want to do if your office is scheduling it, the office will ask the attorney, how much time do you think you're going to need? And the attorney may say, I, I, I probably need four hours. Then you schedule it from 8 to noon. And your office will tell the attorney, now we're scheduling it for 8 to noon. And the doctor has to leave at noon. So that's it. And that way it's already established. You want to establish the parameters. Again, and much of what we're going to talk about in depositions is very similar to courtroom as well. Please know, you may have a great sense of humor. You may even have worked as a stand-up comedian prior to coming to medical school. And that's great. The deposition is not the place for that, nor is the courtroom. Because keep in mind, with the deposition, what makes a deposition much different from the courtroom is that it becomes a written transcript. And so when individuals read the deposition, use the deposition, and if the deposition is read into the court record, if the opposing counsel actually sits and reads the deposition out loud, one of the dilemmas is, and many of you know this from texting on your phone, that what you send is not necessarily what the other person <coughs> perceives and understands as your intent, because they can't hear your tone. They can't hear the levity in your voice. They cannot hear the sarcasm. What they read is flat print. And flat print doesn't carry the same humor or meaning. So you have to be very careful. What you think is being very clever in a deposition may come out as being very disrespectful or may come out as not actually carrying the truth when it is read. So be very careful what you say and how you say it, because the flat written deposition may not transport what you had meant for it to be. And avoid obscenities and avoid absolutely any inappropriate comments, <laughs> ethnic comments, those types of things. Avoid those. You're there merely to tell the truth based on your scientific understanding as a physician. Carry yourself professionally and with respect, and respect all other parties within the parameter of that office of the deposition. Courtroom testimony. Now we're going to shift from the deposition to the courtroom. In the courtroom, you as a physician may be asked to testify. You may come in as a witness. There are two types of witnesses. There are fact witnesses, percipient witnesses, and there are expert witnesses. What is the difference? And have you all covered that yet? Or no, you have. I see the heads going up and down, so I'll just review it quickly. A percipient witness, a fact witness, is just there to tell the facts. Essentially, anyone uh, of sound mind and, and essentially adult years, even younger than adult years, because children can be asked to come in as fact witnesses. Well, let us say anyone could be a fact witness, because anyone can tell the facts of what he or she saw, or what he or she heard. Now again, there are rules, procedural rules, eviden evidentiary rules, with regard to what can be said. Hearsay evidence is precluded under, except under certain um, circumstances. Hearsay is something that you are not strictly privy to. It's coming to you secondhand. As a fact witness, you can only testify as to what you have seen, heard. 
An expert witness is someone that is well versed in the facts related to some science or profession that is beyond the layperson's scope of knowledge. Now, you as physicians have the advantage of that knowledge of medicine, that knowledge of human anatomy and human physiology, and so you all may come in as expert witnesses. What is the difference between an expert, please you don't have to answer that, Dr. Lee. What is the difference between an expert witness and a percipient fact witness? The expert witness gives an opinion. And that is what makes you an expert witness, your ability to give an opinion. Now, we'll, we'll get to this again as to how you become an expert witness. I will have a slide momentarily. Now again, we're going to step back a moment. Courtroom testimony. You may encounter the legal system in a variety of ways. Case in which you participated. Actions that you witnessed and you may come in as a professional consultant. Now, what does that mean? What that means is, as a physician, you may find yourself over time serving as a consultant to attorneys, for attorneys. You may be asked to review charts and to give your medical expert opinion on what the chart means, what this information means with regard to the case the attorney is handling. In those instances, you may review the case, you may give an opinion, you may type up a letter, the attorney may ask a specific question of you, you send a letter, and then ultimately you may be subpoenaed to testify as an expert witness with regard to your review of the chart and your information. Now, this is the key. Should you be asked to testify as an expert witness, an attorney will contact you, an attorney will ask you if you will be able to serve as an expert witness, they'll subpoena you to come in. You will then be on the witness list of that attorney. And through the process of discovery, that attorney's witness list has to be shared with opposing counsel. Because opposing counsel now has a list of all the witnesses that the other counsel is going to bring, you then may be deposed. The reason you may be deposed before trial is because the opposing attorney who has your name on the list may want to know what you're going to talk about. And that's where the deposition comes in. So he or she may then engage in a fishing expedition to find out what it is you're going to say. That is the reason that you just answer yes, no. You don't want to be able to, your goal is not to help the opposing counsel. Your goal is not to give the opposing counsel the game plan. That's his or her responsibility. Your goal in a deposition is merely to say yes or no or give an answer that is appropriate without being too much. Now, you're the attorney, and when I say your attorney, I don't mean that the attorney is defending you. I mean when you're being asked to come in as an expert witness, an attorney is going to bring you in. An attorney is essentially going to hire you. And your time is valuable, and you will be paid for that. And when you are asked to serve as an expert witness, you will explain to the attorney who's asking you to, to present as an expert witness, or an attorney who is deposing you, you will explain this is what you charge per hour for the deposition, and you have a minimum of two hours' time, and a check must be sent to your office before the deposition. Because, alas, notoriously, once a deposition is given, oftentimes, no check will follow. So the check comes in advance. That's how you do it. And you explain that you have to have a check. Let's just say that you charge your fees for depositions, let's just say $500 an hour, and you expect to be paid for two hours up front. Now, if the deposition goes longer, then you will bill them for the extra two hours. Uh, however, if the deposition only goes one hour, you still keep that check for the two hours. So the attorney will most likely interview you for the two hours. <laughs> now, 
when an attorney brings you into the courtroom as an expert witness, what he or she must do is qualify you, because you have to be qualified as an expert witness. What does that mean to be qualified? That means they're going to establish your credentials. You have to do that before the court, before the judge, so that the judge accepts you as an expert witness, because as an expert witness, you're going to do something that no other witness can do, and that is you're going to give an opinion. So you have to be qualified to give that opinion. So when that is done, what the attorney will do, who is bringing you in as his or her expert witness, and in the process of qualifying you, they will seek to establish all of your stellar credentials so that the jury is quite impressed by you. Opposing counsel oftentimes will stipulate, and that is the term that's used, they will stipulate to you as an expert witness. And the reason they stipulate is because they do not want the jury swayed by your stellar credentials. So what opposing counsel oftentimes will do, counsel that has hired you, that is bringing you in, will say, Your Honor, we would like to uh, qualify Dr. Uh, Smith as an expert witness, and we're going to put Dr. Smith on the stand and ask Dr. Smith the following questions. Dr. Smith, will you please tell us your name? Will you please tell us where you live? Will you be in Mexico community? Bless you. Will you please tell us uh, where you attended university? Will you please tell us where you attended medical school? Will you please tell us where you did residency and fellowship? Now, Dr. Smith, um, you've made many publications, have you not? Would you please care to share with us the list of publications? We have several days to hear. And then Dr. Smith will list all his or her publications. And Dr. Smith, is it true that you serve as a uh, consultant to three uh, cable network channels? Yes, that's true. Uh, yeah. Do we not see you on TV? You have your own show. What counsel will seek to do is to show how uh, not only prolific you are in literature and, and, and the articles you've written and your scientific knowledge, we want to show that uh, you really have a good handle on this information, and you are the expert. Opposing counsel will say, Your Honor, we stipulate to uh, Dr. Smith's credentials, and we stipulate to uh, him or her serving as an expert witness, stopping it and nipping it in the bud. They will do that so the jury doesn't get swayed and have stars in their eyes when you take the stand. Now, your attorney, when I say your attorney, the one that subpoenas you to come in and testify, will ask questions of you, and that is called direct examination. And if you all had to discuss cross-examination, direct examination, direct examination is to pull the facts from you, and cross-examination is to do the best possible to impeach your testimony. So that the jury then says, wow, this doctor doesn't know what he or she's talking about. So what happens in the courtroom? There may be several questions that you were asked. And I want you to have a good handle on your answers for this. Because these are accurate and these are appropriate. In the cross-examination, you may be asked if you are a professional witness. Can you tell me, Dr. Smith, are you a professional witness? And your response is, my profession is the practice of medicine. It just so happens that I'm frequently asked to testify on such issues in court because of my expertise on these issues. The attorney will say, thank you, that's enough. That. And then the attorney may ask the opposing counsel, Dr. Smith, is it true that you're being paid for your testimony here today? And your response will be, I am not being paid for my testimony. And we say this without any rancor or anger. We say, Counselor, I am not being paid for my testimony. As yourself, I am being paid for my time, as all the other professionals in the courtroom. I am merely here to tell the truth and to give my best scientific <laughs> understanding of the questions asked. Because as you know, this is an area of expertise for me. You heard my stellar credentials. You won't be allowed to get that in. <laughs> However, remember, you're not being paid for your testimony. Yes, you're being compensated for your time. Not for your testimony. Your testimony is the truth. 
And you're here merely to apply your best medical understanding to the questions that are being asked. Again, in the courtroom, your role is not to become an advocate for the patient. You're not there to win the case. And you may be asked questions that you realize and understand may not fare well for the individual for whom the case has been brought. However, that's not your purpose. That is not your role. The role of the attorneys is to advocate for their clients. And the role of the attorneys is to be the gladiators in the courtroom. You are merely there to share information that others in the courtroom do not have. And that is your purpose. Do your homework. Before you come into the courtroom, review literature. Review the case in question. If there were depositions, read your deposition. If there were interrogatories, reread the interrogatories. Remember what you said. Again, deposition may have been two years prior to the courtroom occurrence. So you want to go back and review it. Things may have changed. Your answers may be different now. And in the attorney, the opposing counsel, may seek to discredit you because your answers have changed. It is important for your attorney to rehabilitate your testimony. And what does that mean? That means on redirect. And are you all familiar with redirect? Good. On redirect, your attorney then will say, Dr. Smith, I noticed, as did the jury and everyone present, that your answer during the deposition or in the interrogatory is different from what you're saying now. Would you please share with the court the reason your answer is different? <laughs> Aha. Now the jury understands the reason there's a difference. And that's important. Appear professional, behave professionally. This applies both on and off the witness stand. Because keep in mind, when you are milling about waiting to come in to testify, you are being observed. In the courtroom, you are being observed. So please, behave professionally. And that, that means, uh, which we'll talk about momentarily, how you dress becomes an issue. Alas, would that it didn't. However, in reality, it does. And we don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So that's important. And before the courtroom's proceedings begin, if you have an opportunity, go to the courtroom, take a look at it, see where you'll be, look at the witness stand, see where the judge is, see where counsel sits, see where the jury box is, because this may be the first time you've ever been in a courtroom. It may be frightening for you. It may be totally unsettling because of our perception of the legal system. And as physicians, we naturally have a sense of not just awe as citizens. As physicians, we even have an underlying sense of fear of the courtroom because we live in a highly litigious society today. And many of us are fearful of the potential of, of a malpractice action. So the courtroom strikes fear into our hearts. And I want you to be familiar with the courtroom before you go, so you feel comfortable with it. Just as the first time you stepped into a classroom in medical school, your very first day, you know the difference now is to how you feel. Now coming in, relaxing, even feeling comfortable enough perhaps to take a nap during a lecture, on your first day, au contraire, that sense of fear and awe. It's the same thing with the courtroom. You want to familiarize yourself so that you're comfortable with it. Dress professionally. Now I have up here the studies. And the studies talk about um, utilizing uh, blue for men, black for women, um, looking believable. And you can read lots of literature on this. There are psychologists. Um, as well as perhaps some psychiatrists out there who make a living not practicing therapy, instead advising witnesses and attorneys on how to dress, how to present in the courtroom, as well as in jury selection. So again, this is an art as well as a science. And so there's a lot of literature out there, and you can read it. 
the real key is to dress comfortably and to dress appropriately, to avoid chewing gum in the courtroom, uh, to avoid as best you can um, annoying movements and gestures, and to sit politely and appropriately, and to sit up straight, to look counsel in the eye when counsel's asking you questions, as well as when giving answers to realize it's okay to speak to the jury because they're the ones for whom the information is to be given. And in fact, in several states, jurors are allowed to ask questions. Now, that doesn't mean that they can just pop questions at you uh, right there. No, they're allowed to ask questions, and they make direct questions to a judge, and then there may be questions for you. So again, keep in mind that you want to be relaxed, yet you want to be professional. Uh, and I keep repeating this. You want to avoid um, costumes and outfits that, that just seem to be a bit outlandish. The reason for that is it may, it may have a negative impact on your credibility. Now again, uh, what does that mean? Well, what it means is for men, we probably want to dress if we can in a suit. And for women, appropriate attire as such. Um, do I like blue jeans? I love blue jeans, and I love wearing blue jeans. And if I could, I would live in blue jeans. I think was it Neil Diamond who sang the song Forever in Blue Jeans? If I could, I would. However, in a courtroom, it's not appropriate. It's not. And uh, just as in the practice of medicine, there will be times when uh, we, we must dress in a certain attire. Um, so please keep that in mind. Uh, in fact, today, um, I have to leave from here directly and drive to uh, Hannibal, Missouri uh, to be seeing patients there at, at a clinic there. And typically, I wear a different attire, a more comfortable attire. And I wear black jeans and then the, the sport coat and tie and shirt. And I was going to wear that here today. And I thought, egad, I'm lecturing on appropriate courtroom attire. And I thought it would be inappropriate for me to come in in my cowboy boots and, and dark jeans. Uh, please know, though, inside of me, that's what I'm in right now, is my uh, jeans and, and cowboy boots. Uh, again, with jewelry, too, one must be careful. Because keep in mind that jurors are at an unconscious level. Now I'm not just sounding like an attorney explaining to you courtroom testimony procedure. I'm going to sound like a psychiatrist. Jurors are humans. And they have underlying issues as well. And so if you come in, be decked and be jeweled, they may find that to be uh, offensive or they may be irritated by it. So please, be careful. Jewelry as well must be appropriate and, and comfortably toned. Once you're seated, sit up straight. Look at the attorney who is asking you questions, both the one that has brought you in as well as opposing counsel, or perhaps the, the judge may say something to you, and look to the jurors as well. Um, when you are sworn in, look at the jury and say in a loud, clear voice, I do. For those of you that have been married, it will be easy for you to say that. You've already been through that. Keep your hands in your lap. Keep them away from your mouth. And don't fidget. And, and I will tell you, these are the kinds of things and I say this now as a psychiatrist, you send an unconscious message to the jurors. If your hand is up to your mouth, it's saying either that you're not wanting to answer that question or what you're saying may not be the truth. That's the unconscious message you're sending. If you're fidgeting, they think that you are nervous. You are nervous because you're either unsure or being untruthful. So you don't want to fidget and you don't want to cover your mouth. Please don't play with your hair and don't uh, pick at body orifices, orify, and um, if you need to ask the judge a question, which you may, what you want to do is very respectfully turn to the judge and say, Your Honor, may I ask a question? And then wait for the judge to respond. The judge may say yes, or the judge may say no. However, most likely, the judge will then honor your request for a question. Same thing. When an attorney is asking you a question, if you didn't hear the question clearly, or if you were nervous, and you don't feel you really received the question appropriately, just ask for it to be repeated. Just say, counselor, may I request for you to repeat the question? Period. You don't even have to give an explanation. 
for uh, wanting it repeated. It's the responsibility of the attorney to ask the question clearly. Also keep in mind, the attorney may engage in certain gamesmanship. Attorneys are not allowed to ask compound questions. However, an attorney may do that as a means of throwing you off or as a means of confusing you. And it is up to the attorney that brought you to the courtroom to object. And there are very strict rules on what may be objected to and how specific an objection must be. A judge may sustain an objection or may reject the objection. Um, that's not up to you to worry about. However, if an attorney asks a question of you and the other attorney stands up and say, I object, and gives the grounds upon which he or she objects, don't answer the question until the judge has made a determination on whether or not you can answer. And the judge will say, the witness will please respond to the question. Or, objection sustained, uh, the witness will not respond to that question. Don't be combative. Avoid that, please. Let the attorneys become as nasty as they want. They're trying to bait you, as I mentioned earlier. They also know if they keep someone talking sooner or later, they will contradict themselves. So again, answers are to the point, honest, and then just stop. If you keep getting asked the same question repeatedly, do not expound on your first answer. If what you gave was what you feel and believe to be the truth, that's what you feel and believe to be the truth. And just because the attorney keeps asking you the same question over and over, doesn't mean you have to change your answer. Be sure to give truth and to be as, as succinct as possible. That's the key. Now, what else do attorneys do? And you want to be careful with this. Attorneys will come in and they'll hold up a book. And they may hold up a book with which you're familiar and that goes along with your practice of medicine and or your specialty. In psychiatry, uh, an attorney may hold up a DSM-IV-TR. That's a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, number four, transitional, because in May, the DSM-V will be coming out. And by now, all of you have gone through your psychiatry rotations. Many of you have run screaming from your psychiatry rotations. It's OK. If an attorney holds up the DSM-IV-TR, he or she may say, um, Dr. Smith, would you agree that uh, this is the DSM-IV-TR? And you'll say, yes, it is. Yes, I, it is. You may want to say, counselor, may I see that? And then look through it and say, yes, it is a DSM-IV-TR. And then the attorney may say, the DSM-IV-TR, this is the quintessential text of psychiatry. Dr. Smith, would you agree that this is the single most important text in psychiatry and that all of psychiatry is found in here and comes from here? And every decision that you and every other psychiatrist makes must come from this because this is the text wherein everything in psychiatry is found. Wow. What do you say? Yes or no? You say no? Can you discredit the DSM-IV-TR? You say, yes, is this the Bible of psychiatry? And your response is neither yes or no. You say, your honor, jurors, counselor, the DSM-IV-TR is one of the sources that we use in psychiatry for making diagnoses. We utilize a lot of approaches. This can help us. However, it's merely a guide. And that's your response. The reason is, if they utilize this text and allow you to corroborate their wanting to say it is the quintessential, single most important text, they're setting a trap to snap on you. Because, unless it's your attorney who's bringing you in, but you've already discussed this with your attorney, so that won't happen. Because they may do that. They may say to you, you agree that everything in psychiatry is found in here? And if you say yes, 
And they may turn to a page in here and say, Doctor, on page 63, can you tell me what's in here? You may be hard pressed. Hopefully, you prepared your boards and you say, Yes, I believe that's the section on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Is that correct, counsel? No. In fact, what it, it is. Um, however, <laughs> what will happen is you don't want to be caught in that gambit. So you merely want to say, Yes, that you want to say the DSF 4TR or Goodman and Gilman or whatever text that they present is one of the sources that we use in helping us to make decisions. However, it is a guide, and we have to rely on our expertise and knowledge as a specialist in this field to make the ultimate decision. These are the things you want to be able to say. You don't want them to uh, force you into a corner, to move you into a gambit, as it were. If you make a mistake, admit it. Don't try to cover it up. Nobody's going to hold it against you. They will take you to task if they think you're not telling the truth. So if you make a mistake, it's OK to say, you know, I realize I answered it this way earlier. However, on further thought, and in looking at the information, I admit I was nervous when I answered that question. And on further thought, I feel this is, this is really where things are. OK, it's all right. You're human, and you may get nervous, and you may misspeak. So you want to be able to correct that. Don't memorize your testimony. The reason you don't want to memorize your testimony, it won't feel real to the jury. It will look stiff. It will look rehearsed. And you'll not be able to present that same type of approach on cross-examination. So you want to be human. You want to be real. You want to be professional. And you want to be knowledgeable. Now, what if the other side, if opposing counsel asks you a question that you feel is objectionable, can you pause? You can give a, a, a pause for just a second to wait to see if your attorney objects. If your attorney doesn't object, then you must answer the question. And be very careful about that. You don't want to be in the position of sitting in the witness stand Having a question asked, and you keep looking over at your attorney, the jury will perceive that as you're looking to the attorney for guidance on how to answer the question, and then they won't feel that you are being truthful. So there we are. Same, we just addressed that. Present your testimony clearly, slowly, and loudly. You wanted to project to the farthest juror. Again, as we mentioned earlier, avoid distracting mannerisms. Please don't chew gum in the courtroom. Uh, the questions are for the juror's benefit, so you want to respect the jurors and observe them. Don't make overbroad statements that you have to correct later. Again, succinct, direct, the truth. As I mentioned there, be careful when an attorney asks, wouldn't you agree that? Be careful. They're leading you down a path. You want to be able to have a question asked when they say, wouldn't you agree that? Then instead of saying yes or no, give your answer to the question. Now the attorney may say, and may turn to the judge and say, your honor, would you please advise the witness to testify yes or no? And if you're forced to testify yes or no, then you testify yes or no. And then if you can get in a qualifying answer, the attorney most likely will stop you from that. And then rely on your attorney for rehabilitation on redirect. Again, as it says, as best you can, do not allow an attorney to put words in your mouth. Man, it's not easy when you're sitting there in the witness stand because they have control. Don't become angry. That's not your role. Because if you do, the juror, jurors may misperceive your answers, and you, and you just don't want to go there. Remain calm, even tempered throughout. Again, you're not there to win the case. You're merely there to answer questions. And if an attorney is badgering you, 
and you remain calm, the jury will observe this and feel that you are being badgered and harassed, and they will be sympathetic with you. Be courteous, and again, you're not there to amuse and entertain the jury. So please don't become a quote unquote wise guy or wise lady. Don't, don't make sarcastic comments. Just answer the questions. Answer only the questions asked. Don't volunteer information. And as an expert witness, again, you provide an opinion. Do so reasonably, be able to provide sound scientific support to what the current trend of thought is. You may be asked, have you talked to anybody about this case? Answer truthfully. They may ask, did you consult with the attorney before coming to the courtroom? Did the attorney who, who hired you, and they may say it that way, again to discredit you, did the attorney who hired you sit down and talk with you about the case before and prepare you for this case? And again, the reality is, hopefully the attorney spoke with you before the case. Hopefully the, the attorney explained what he or she is bringing you in to testify about and for the purpose. And so if you were asked, have you spoken with the attorney, answer truthfully and, and explain that, yes, uh, counselor did explain to me what the courtroom procedure would be and what the case uh, was going to be addressing and did ask me certain questions and did state that I would uh, be expected to be able to address the issues that we're addressing here in the courtroom. Uh, it's okay to say that. If you want to say, uh, you know, I, again, my testimony and my answers are based upon my scientific understanding. No one has influenced my answers. This, I'm here as a professional and as a scientist. And, it's, and, and you want to be able to say that. Once you have testified, you don't want to go out into the hallway and be talking to everybody. And you don't want to talk with other witnesses. You testify, you're done. You don't ask other witnesses about their testimony. You don't volunteer information about your testimony. Serving as an expert witness can enhance your practice. It's great to have subspecialty certification that will help when you are brought in as an expert. And remember, you're a scientist. Be professional, objective. You're an expert, therefore you give an opinion, and do not become a hired gun. Ah, I just have, I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, for those of you, this is not meant to be an egregiously self-serving uh, advertisement. Um, however, for those of you that are interested in uh, medical jurisprudence, medical ethics, and the information we discussed, uh, there is a four-disc set of nine hours of lectures available on Amazon.com um, that you can get that have actually done. It's a course that I teach. So if any of you are interested later in getting a good review, if you need it for boards, on medical jurisprudence, medical ethics, basic law for physicians, um, the medical jurisprudence, medical ethics course is available on Amazon.com. So I just mentioned that for you. In fact, it's not available yet. It will be available next month. Uh, that being said, we have some time left. I wanted to leave time for questions and then a couple of visual demonstrations. Uh, <laughs> any questions, please, if you have them, please ask. OK. Few visual demonstrations, and if other any other questions come to mind, then we will address them. <coughs> Key issues. There may be times when you appear in the courtroom because of malpractice. Malpractice issues, please keep in mind. We hear a lot about it. However, however, please know that not everyone is going to be facing a malpractice case in their life. And it's not something that we all have to live in fear. It's just important to keep in mind that should that happen, you want to be certain that you have access to an attorney, and you also want to be certain that you have access to good malpractice insurance. A quick visual demonstration, if I might. A 
a deck of cards. Shuffle the cards so that hopefully, and I hope you all can see, that this deck is hopefully as mixed up as I am. And I will ask, if I may, may I ask you, because you're close to me, just to say stop at any time. Very good. I'm going to have you please remove the card at which you stop me. I don't want to see it. I will step back. And I just want you to show it about the room so that others may see it. And once everyone has seen it, I just want you to hold it face down so I cannot see it. And I just want you to say, we've seen it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to hand you the deck. And then I'm going to ask you please to take the card and place it into the deck. And then mix the cards so that the card that you selected at random is now placed back into the deck, mixed in, and so now it is randomly placed in the deck. And thank you. We want to be careful. When we are practicing medicine, we do not want to be cavalier in our practice. You see, what we don't want to do, and this is the same in the court, if we are there to testify, or if we are doing a deposition, we don't want to cavalierly give an answer and say, oh, yes. Because you see, imagine you're surprised that I selected the card that is not yours. Imagine my surprise if it had been. <laughs> if we answer in the courtroom cavalierly, or we practice medicine as such, we want to be sure we have one of these. As a magician, I have to carry. My magician's now practice insurance. <laughs> the most common contract in the United States is the insurance contract. The least often read document in the United States is the insurance contract. So please be certain that when you obtain a malpractice policy, you read the terms and conditions of your policy. The first condition of this policy is all parties involved must be playing with the full deck. <laughs> Hopefully we're there. And you want to be certain that the insurance policy that you have covers your practice. <laughs> Question. OK, thank you. <laughs> Anyone in the room comfortable with bingo? Does anyone play bingo? All right, we have a bingo player. I have six bingo cards, and they have random numbers anywhere from 1 to 47 on them. And I'm going to ask you silently to think of any number you would like, silently, between 1 and 47. OK? And once you have your number, I will come up to you. Do you have your number? Very good. I'm going to, you're fine. I'm going to ask, do you, don't tell me what your number is, but do you see your number anywhere on that card? You do. I'm going to ask you just to hold that. Thank you. Do you see your number anywhere on that card? Do you see your number anywhere on that card? Okay. And I appreciate your taking the time to be thorough, excellent. Do you see your number anywhere on that card? Okay. Thank you. Do you see your number anywhere on that card? Thank you. And do you see your number anywhere on that card? Yes. OK. Thank you. Please hold on to your number. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> Thank you.
you all remember that we used books the first time? I had the privilege, pleasure, and honor of meeting with you all. Yes, yes. <laughs> I brought some books back. And in fact, today we are talking about medical jurisprudence. So I brought The Dream of the Accused. And again, The Dream of the Accused reminds us that in 75% of all civil cases, medical information may be involved. In 25% of all criminal cases, medical information may be involved. We want to be certain that when we chart, we chart very clearly, we chart very professionally. We want to be sure that when we testify in a courtroom, we are clear and concise. And when we are engaged in being deposed, that our answers are short, concise, and appropriate. Bless you. Now, if I may, may I hand you this text? Would you agree that that is the most authoritative text on the dream of the accused we have available? And the answer is, it's only one source. Yes. Can you tell us how many pages are in that book? 199. 199. From 1 to 199, may I ask, what page would you like from 1 to 199? Sure. I knew that. But that's OK. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, please, to turn to page 88 in the book. And then I'm going to ask you, please, to look at the first line, the top of page 88. And I'm going to ask you to silently select the biggest word, the longest word, the most letters, the most syllables, because that will make this the most impressive. And then if you want, I'll ask you please to show that same word to the person next to you so that he can corroborate it with you. Very good. Now have you send the book back down. Magazines. Thank you. And I brought a myriad of magazines with me from my waiting room at the office. Several business magazines, the Journal of the Missouri Bar, uh, Washington University, Current Psychiatry, many magazines. And I'm going to ask, if I may, May I ask you please just to point to three of the magazines, if you will. These three right here. Yes? Okay, very good. And then, let's see here, we'll come up the side here. <coughs> May I ask you please to point to two of the magazines. These two, very good. And that will then leave us one. Can I hand you that? I'm going to ask you, please, if you will, just to look through the magazine, find a page with print on it. And once you do, I'm going to ask you, please, to silently select a word. Now, for today's purposes, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to select the biggest word, the longest word, the most letters, the most syllables, because that will make this the most impressive. And please look through, and once you find the word, please show it to your colleague. Take your time. No need to rush. This is the same thing in the courtroom. When you're being asked to testify, we don't want to rush. We're not stressed. We're being asked a question. We're evaluating it, analyzing it, and now we're going to give the appropriate answer scientifically. If you'll please send the magazine back down. We have a lot of things floating around. We have numbers, thank you, words, pages that were selected, thank you. And if you are thinking of a number, if you were asked to, or if you have a word tucked away, if you'll please raise your hand. Yes. The number that you're thinking of, please also, when 
when we get these correct, we should be all day, when we get these correct, please let us know. Be excited. Uh, feel as if you're a contestant on a game show. What is it? Yes. Come on down, exactly. Because you see, you're thinking of the number. And the number that you're thinking of reminds us when we give an answer on a deposition, when we give an answer in the courtroom, we want to be specific. The number you're thinking of, if I'm right, is the number 34. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And a word was selected from a magazine. Is that correct? I don't want you to tell me the word, but I'd like you to share with your colleagues present the first letter of your word. H. Just okay, the letter H. And a word was selected at random from a page that was selected at random. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the word selected at random both from a magazine that was selected at random and a page that was selected at random reminds us to go work in the courtroom. And I'm getting a picture of a letter that you're thinking of, and if I'm right, I think the letter, I'm getting a letter E. And, and in fact, what we want to do is irritating movements, inappropriate attire, anger, irritability, all of those as a witness need to be eliminated. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and our role is not to be an advocate for the patient. Our role is not to be an advocate in the courtroom for whomever the plaintiff is. We're the defendant. Our role is merely to tell the truth, to apply the science that we know as a physician to the facts, and to be the best clinician, physician, and scientist we can be, and most truthful. Even though the result may come from the court, heartbreakingly, is that correct? <laughs> almost being done with your initial medical education. I'm proud of you all, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of your education. Thank you.